the ritual changing of the guard outside Buckingham Palace attracts, as always, tourists from all over the world. But this sort of thing isn't at all attractive to most wildlife in the capital. This is the natural habitat for only a few species. The house sparrow is one. For thousands of years, it's lived close to man. Oblivious to the band, a colony of these urban specialists nests in the wrought ironwork of Buckingham Palace gates. A few other species have come to tolerate this kind of thundering, rocky environment. One is the starling. It'll nest even in the lion's mouth outside the palace. The mallard duck, too, can put up with a bustle around the Victoria Memorial. But to survive in the city, most wildlife needs a refuge in this hostile landscape. Just behind the palace, there is such a haven. The 39 acres of Her Majesty's private back garden has become a remarkable wildlife reserve in the heart of the city. We know more about the wildlife that has colonised these gardens than we do about that of most parks and gardens in London. Over the years, they've been studied by a team of naturalists, led by David McClintock. Fred, come and look at all this. With help from the palace gardeners. The survey, in fact, lasted for five years in the early 1960s. And in that time, we found 260 different plants, wild or naturalised. And since those days, I've added nearly another 50 since, because I still have the privilege of coming in. And it is a wonderful privilege, and I keep close watch on what comes in this garden. And I'm thrilled to find new plants. And practically every time I come in, I find a new one's arrived. What we got well, here. Fred, look, look at this. Yeah. Now, this is quite a discovery. That's new, surely. I don't think I've seen this in the palace grounds before. This is a chervil of sorts. Yeah. And you can eat this too if you yeah. want to. There. Good. There's a white campion yeah. coming on. Yeah. That'll be a nice big white flower. Yeah. And look at all the hemlock water droplets. It's spraying enormously, isn't it? The wild plants grow in untended areas of the gardens. Aren't they? Oh, look, this. There's a, there's a beauty. Look at that lovely crimson one. Isn't it a good one? Their seeds have been carried by birds, blown in on the wind, or they've arrived with potting plants. Well, these are oxide daisies. Some people call them marguerites. And in about two or three weeks' time, they'll be an absolute blaze of colour, large, white, two-inch daisies. How some rare plants got here is a real puzzle. Well, here's one of the great specialities and surprises of this garden. It's the Adderstang fern. You mightn't think it's a fern, but it's related to the ferns. And when it's fully out, all this will be yellow. It's a lovely sight. And it's quite amazing to find it here because it's normally a constituent of old meadowland. And we only found it here about three or four years ago. But how it got here is anybody's guess. However, it isn't a mystery how most wildlife got here. Many spiders, for example, move easily across town 
and find all they need to survive in the gardens. 57 species were found in the original survey. There were hundreds of insects like this damselfly and feeding on insects an impressive number of breeding birds. Have a look at this, David. What have you found, Fred? Yeah, we're finding the top of this xylia here. Well, who would have guessed it? Now, look at it. More in. There are about 20 different species that breed here alone in these under 40 acres. And that's not just one nest each. There are several nests of naturally lots of them. But 20 is a considerable number to breed here year after year in this relatively small area. This is the long-tailed tit, which builds a dome nest of moss, spiders' webs and feathers. It's a recent arrival in these gardens. The range of species does vary a little from year to year. Most summers, this little bird arrives from Africa to nest in the gardens. It's the spotted flycatcher, a rarity in central London. All the common birds of suburban parks and gardens nest here, right in the centre of town. Alongside the ornamental flamingos on the lake, some species of wild duck do well. The mallard, the pochard, and tufted duck. Canada geese also nest here. It's easy for birds to reach this city island, but they don't all nest here. In late summer, black-headed gulls feed on the lawns, but there isn't the space for a breeding colony. There's another regular visitor, which eats ducklings as well as fish, the grey heron. But herons don't nest here. The range of breeding birds is limited by the size of the garden and its range of vegetation. But birds do very well compared with other animals. It's very difficult for wildlife which doesn't fly to reach the gardens. One animal which does, crossing where the trees in Constitution Hill form a bridge into the gardens, is the grey squirrel but few other furry animals have made it here. We did once see one vole. That was a famous occasion. I was with Peter Crowcroft. We were coming from different directions. We both exclaimed at the same moment, goodness, there's a vole. We never saw it again, never seen it before or since. There was once a frog found in here, and it had a great red belly on, and it was looked on as frightfully exciting, and all sorts of photos were taken. But that was only one frog. How it got in, we can't think, and it didn't last long either. We've never found a toad, anything like that. Impressive though the gardens are as a wildlife reserve, there's an imbalance in the range of species found here. The reason only some wildlife can get here is that the palace gardens are like an island in a sea of traffic and concrete. Only those creatures which can find their way across town can colonize such islands. The range of wildlife found in London is governed by the number and nature of its green islands. Some will support many more species than others. Oxford ecologist Malcolm Coe. I think when a biologist studies an island anywhere, and London here is no different, um, there are three things really that you've got to look for. 
Number one is, of course, its size. You can obviously expect many more animals and plants to reach a piece of land that is large than is, in fact, small. The next thing is the structural diversity. How much open space has it got? How much rough ground has it got? How many big trees? How many small trees? And how many different sorts of plants has it got? And the last thing, and certainly the most important of all, how far is it away from other areas with large numbers of species in them from which new colonizers can come? These are the wide open spaces of Richmond Park, the largest and one of the wildest of London's Green Islands. Amongst the herds of park deer are birds not found in the centre of town. The two and a half thousand acres of Richmond Park support a much wider range of species than can be found in Buckingham Palace Garden. Some of this wildlife has been able to move into the centre of town, while some has not. To discover why that is, Malcolm Coe set off on safari with gamekeeper David Smith. If we think about the enormous number of animals that do and can live in places like this, what we have to do is to look at the way they live and the sort of characteristic they've got that can tell us why it is that one animal can come in from the outside, from the countryside, and do so well in the town and the city, and, and others can't. And almost certainly, one of the best examples that I suppose we all know about today is, of course, the fox that has been so successful now in penetrating right into the very hearts of our towns and the badger, which has got as far as this right here in Richmond Park. Why is it then that the badger has got this far and can get no further and the fox is right in the middle of the city? The badger is an animal that is very specific in its requirements. It is also a great earthworm eater. Um, it is also a great scavenger, but above all, they are very social and they live in things that we call sets. Places where they have excavated, in many cases, they've been excavating in the British countryside to our knowledge since at least the Doomsday Book. And the sort of ground that they can dig these big holes in to have there, groups of animals living together, is very specific. In this case, you can see it very clearly there. Look at it. It's sand. Um, and if you've got sand, then you can dig in it very easily. And so, when there's plenty of sand, there will be badgers. If, for instance, you were to say, well, Buckingham Palace Gardens has got lots of sand in it, why can't it go and dig there? Just look at the badger. Great animal, short, stocky, stumpy-legged. The good old badger, he's great at crawling under little holes in fences, as we've seen all the way around here. But climbing over a fence, no. Jumping over things, no. That really isn't the badger's way of life. He stalks along and he's a really rough old chap. Um, the fox is a much more agile animal. And I'm sure that that is the major reason, not simply the lack of habitat, but a badger just would never have got right into the middle of the city. And this is why we have the badger coming as far as Richmond. And he sits on the top of the hill there, looking down towards the city. And as the foxes move past on their way to London, he looks at them and he says, you must be crazy the fox isn't crazy. It just has quite a different lifestyle from the badger. It's much more nimble and can jump high fences. The fox has a much more varied diet than the badger. It'll eat fruit and birds, as well as worms and beetles. Unlike the badger, the fox doesn't breed in large colonies. It's more of a loner. Foxes have thrived in suburban back gardens, and they've moved right into the centre of London. Recently, a fox's earth was discovered here, 
by the Serpentine restaurant in Hyde Park. Many people who are here today will talk about that these animals, like foxes, have become adapted to living in the city. Um, use that word if you like, but do not imagine that what we're saying is there's some sort of evolutionary modern adaptation. In other words, they've acquired some quite new behavior or new habitat. That's not it at all. What, in fact, they've done is they've capitalized on the sort of behavioral sequences they had before, which they used in the countryside perhaps not quite so frequently. When they come in here, they are, so to speak, pre-adapted. They were already having these behaviors, and when they get in the city, this opportunism enables them to survive, as they do today extraordinarily well. The fox now ranges over the whole of London, from suburbia to the inner city. It isn't confined to such large islands as Richmond Park. But many other creatures are, like the badger, restricted by their lifestyle to the fringes of town. This is the jackdaw. These birds are pulling fur from the red deer in Richmond Park to line their nests. A few years ago, there were jackdaws in some inner London parks. Now, colonies of these birds are found only on the fringes of town. It's a bit of a mystery why this is. Probably the jackdaw needs access to large open spaces for some of its food and nesting material. However, there is a bird quite similar to the jackdaw, which has colonized even the most central urban islands. This is the carrion crow. Nearly every London square now has its pair of crows. They raise five or six young early in the year. The secret of the crow's success is its lifestyle. Naturalist Eric Sims. The carrion crow is one of London's most successful birds. It's adaptable, it has a whole range of different foods that it takes. It will take the eggs and the young of small birds, and of course there are many garden birds in London. It will forage along the tide line looking for anything that's washed up. It will chase grey squirrels, in fact it will eat practically anything. And this is a great advantage for a bird that's living in town. It also builds its nest very high up, and this is an advantage because it means that uh, enemies can't get at it. So we have a bird, really, which at one time was very, very rare in London, but after the First and Second World Wars, gamekeeping was much less, and the carrion crow had a chance to recover its numbers, and there were so many of them in the country, they began to move into the suburbs and then, of course, into the centre of towns. So we have a bird which actually was moving into an area where everything was quite right for it. It was pre-adapted for all these advantages and conditions that were there.
Like the crow, a few other creatures have colonized these inner urban islands. Since the 1920s, blackbirds have moved from rural areas to the shrubberies of London parks. The wood pigeon, too, will woo its mate amongst the crowds of lunchtime strollers in the city. Wildlife exploits these islands not by radically altering its behavior, but by chancing upon the basic elements it needs to survive. Wherever it is in the city, wildlife needs to find in this artificial landscape a substitute for its natural habitat. Any creatures which need marshy ground have a special problem. Frogs and toads have suffered for centuries from the draining of land. Now, however, the frog seems to be doing better in town than the toad. This isn't because the toad is less adaptable than the frog. The toad's difficulty is that its lifestyle makes it less suited to the town in the breeding season. In February, toads emerge from their winter hibernation holes and make straight for a breeding pond. Because toads have quite large territories outside the breeding season, they may have to travel a mile or more to the pond. They often have a long and hazardous journey. The males will often waylay females and piggyback in the mating embrace all the way to the pond. They're very fussy about the ponds they use. Nobody knows quite why. And hundreds will head for the same spot. Frogs behave in much the same way. But they usually hibernate in or near their breeding pond and have a shorter distance to travel. They also seem to be less fussy than toads about the ponds they use. In search of a substitute for their natural, marshy habitat, frogs seem to have been more successful than the toads. They're better able to exploit the suburban garden pond. As with the frogs and toads, quite small differences in behavior can mean success or failure for wildlife in the strange landscape of the city.